with um, reviving our motivation just briefly with refuge in bodhicitta. Sange chodon sogi chonam la janjo padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yangi pe sonam ki drola penche sange jupa sho sange chodon sogi chonam la janjo padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yangi pe sonam ki Rola benje sange jupa sho sange churam sogi churam la janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam ki rola benje sange jupa sho okay so Manjushri and Manjushri's mantra and then miscellaneous questions. Um, so if you've got the sadhana in front of you, um, you know, just kind of like do a little scroll through and see if there's bits that you've really been wanting to clarify. Uh, we'll start with just a brief um, iconography lesson here. And so um, let's see. So this is, I think you all know this much, that Manjushri is the embodiment of the enlightened wisdom of all the Buddhas, realizing the ultimate nature of reality. Realizing the ultimate nature of reality means realizing that all things are empty of inherent existence. Uh, his left hand holds the stem of a lotus flower, which supports the perfection of Wisdom Sutra, an important text which reveals the method for developing insight and realizing wisdom. So one of those was the Heart Sutra that we recited yesterday. And his right hand holds a flaming sword, symbolizing the power of wisdom to cut through ignorance, the root of all suffering. And that little blurb is from Andy Weber, who's a renowned Tonka painter. And it's not by accident that I chose a Tonka painter um, to describe the iconography. So in most um, commentaries on texts, there's brief explanations of the iconography, brief explanations of the mantra, and then a lot more in depth about the process. But when you're really wanting to find out about all the little details, usually tanka painters know heaps. And it's really um, kind of more direct if you're just like, why blue there? Why red there? Like all the little minute details, what parts are acceptable to be flexible, for the artist's expression and which elements absolutely have to be there because they came from the enlightened mind of the Buddhas. And um, so Tonka painters are a really good resource. So of course, I'm a fan of um, Andy Weber's knowledge. He's a really uh, very cool guy, if you can ever get to one of his classes. Um, one of his students, Fred Vanderzee, who um, his images are behind me, he does digital Tonkas that are beautiful, high resolution, and he knows a lot as well. And then, uh, especially for those of you in New Zealand, um, Ella Brewer is an amazing Tonka artist and she knows so much about this kind of stuff as well. So that's just kind of a side note. If there are details that you're not able to find in commentaries and texts, it might be that actually the artists know more um, about the specifics of those things. Kind of once you get into the deep dive into practice, just the generalities are enough because really you're focusing on the teachings that they represent. So of course the common question is, why is Manjushri orange? <laughs> why is he orange? We don't have a lot of orange Buddhas out there. Yes, we have many, you know, white, red, blue, yellow, uh, red, um, but not many orange. What's the deal with the orange? And there's many schools of thought. Um, in Tibetan, they, they don't have a word for orange so much as like um, dark yellow. <laughs> um, or light red is pink. They don't say pink, they say light red. You know, they don't say orange, they say dark yellow. So you know how Tara, it belongs to the Amitabha Buddha family, who is a red Buddha, but she's green, which is related to Amoga City. And, it, and you're kind of like, okay, so she's got elements related to both. Some schools of thought think that Manjushri similarly though he belongs to the Akshobhya Buddha family, has a relationship with Ratnasambhava. 
And um, so that's one school of thought. The other school of thought is that because orange is in the yellow family, it relates to the power of increase. And that reasoning makes more sense to me given what Manjushri does. Manjushri is about the increase of wisdom, the increase of memory, the increase of intelligence, the increase of knowledge, all of these levels of increase, increase. So uh, my feeling is that that presentation makes a lot of sense. Um, he does belong to the Akshogya Buddha family, which if the artist was very, very, very detailed, you would able to find the Akshobhya in his top knot, but almost no artists go to the trouble of putting the actual head of the Buddha family. They usually just put the little nub at the top of the top knot, the Ushnisha, yeah, and that kind of represents the Guru Yidam and the head of the Buddha family. So Akshobhya. Do you guys know about Akshobhya? What do you know about Akshobhya? <laughs> Some things, no things. Um, the, the, the background is that every single Buddha belongs to a family. And it doesn't mean a blood family. It means more of what energy do they emphasize. So all, all Buddhas emphasize a particular en energy, even though all of them are equal and all of them embody all of them. This is all for the sake of our minds, right? So it's not like a... Um, hierarchy of better worst Buddhas or lesser or more Buddhas. It's more in terms of what do we relate to. So when we say that Manjushri belongs to the Akshobhya Buddha family, what we're saying is that he, he is very much focused on transforming the energy that accompanies anger into what is called mirror-like wisdom. So he can't transform anger into wisdom, but he can help us transform the energy that accompanies anger into wisdom. The particular wisdom is called mirror-like wisdom. So just kind of thinking about why those words, why that vibe? And it's very much about the element that the Akshobhya Buddha family relates to. The element is water. And water, when it's afflicted, like, imagine it like water boiling. Yeah, or imagine anger is like water boiling. When water is boiling, it doesn't reflect anything clearly. It's just bubbles of distortion. But there's a lot of energy there in a boiling water. But it doesn't reflect, even though the nature of water is to reflect. Imagine this relationship between water and anger, yeah. And then imagine when it's still and it's settled, then it's like this mirror-like wisdom where water is reflecting perfectly, you know, the mountains surrounding and the trees and all of that. So water can be reflective or distortive, just like the energy that accompanies anger can be distortive, but it also can be moved and elevated into this other form. So I hope that's kind of making sense how that goes together. And, and I think that it's, very useful to think about, for lack of a better word, the good qualities of anger. There are no good qualities of anger, okay? But the good qualities of anger in the sense of when you are just in a rage, don't you have a lot to say? You have a lot to say in your head, yes? I mean, sometimes it's just like a roar of thunder, depending on how far gone you've got. But Sometimes when you're angry, you have a fierce intelligence that accompanies that anger. And the sad thing is that your wish to harm and your wish to retaliate and your wish to defend in a neurotic way co-ops your intelligence. But it's not to say you don't have intelligence. You can be very precise, little stingers, little jabs that go straight to the heart of the person you're mad at and it just goes straight in. And that's part of why anger is so horrible is that it just like hits the point really painfully in the other person. But imagine if you took that fierce, active, precise intelligence that you have when you're angry and got rid of the wish to harm. Then you would just be left with the fierce intelligence, the active energy, the assertiveness, the passion that comes with anger without any of the wish to harm. So this is what Manjushri helps us do. And this is the Buddha family that he belongs to. And in Kriya Tantra, we usually just talk about three of the five Buddha families, the other two being Amitabha, related to attachment, transforming into discriminating wisdom. 
and virachana related to ignorance being transformed into all encompassing um, or um, the wisdom of Dharmadhatu. So those three are kind of the main families that the Kriya Tantra deities belong to. There are five, the other two for highest yoga tantra um, are related to Amoga City and um, Ratna Sambhava, which are transforming jealousy into swift action and pride into earth-like wisdom, respectively. Interesting side note, um, if you're curious about the five Buddha families in like a daily life, looking at personality type way, there is, um, there's a book by a woman named Irene Rockwell. And I think it's called something like The Five Wisdoms. Something like The Five Wisdoms, Irene Rockwell. It's a really cool book and it's written very conversationally and colloquially about how to kind of navigate what your default family is and how to interact with others of other families. So it's kind of like Buddhist personality test, yeah? Um, it's, it's very interesting. So the five Buddha families are, are a fun thing to explore because they each relate to an element and a time of day and an aggregate. And, you know, it's just a really interesting thing to have a look at. But um, I really recommend that book. If you're wanting a more technical presentation that's still very experiential, Journey Without, pa Journey Without Goal by Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche has a really interesting explanation of the five Buddha families as well. So that's just kind of fun side note. So why orange? <laughs> he is orange because I think, because he is related to the power of increase. And that is unrelated to his Buddha family because every Buddha family can emphasize one of the powers, peace, increase, power or wrath. And if that seems like it's going fast, it's because we talked about it last month when we did White Tara, we went into peace, increase, power and wrath a little bit more last time. Um, and that's, again, something that all tantric deities might have a sub emphasis. So Manjushri is got a peaceful, sweet face. So he's in general a peaceful deity, but there's a little frowny. Yeah, his eyebrows sometimes are depicted a little frowny, not too frowny, showing that um, he's got a little bit of that transformative energy that accompanies anger. And also this increase has a little bit more oomph and power to it. So did I lose anyone? I know it's a lot of like categories and subcategories and subcategories and you eventually kind of get your head around it. But if you know, oh, he belongs to the family that helps with anger, that's useful, yes? What does anger look like when it's not angry? Mirror-like, you know, it's mirror-like, like water, yeah. So that's enough for probably getting on with, but um, do, you have, do you have questions about the iconography, we talked about how um, the lotus, sun, and full moon are the three principal aspects of the path. But yeah, Eve, go ahead. Okay, this is great. Because this, well, I think when I visualize, it's the meaning, the iconography that I focus on, and it really makes it more meaningful. So um, could you talk a little bit about nectar? That comes up for me, like, you know, what's in the what's in the bowl and and it but because it was referred to a lot in the with the seven um wisdoms you know yeah. in the text talks about becoming the nectar so anything you want to say would be appreciated this time yes and you know and in a way you're putting me on the spot because it's sort of like a not general audience conversation on one sense but the general things i can tell you is when we say nectar think light yeah, when we say nectar, think light. When we say nectar, think I'm becoming receptive to blessings. Receptive to blessings. And the blessings take the form of light and these implements. So this kind of like light that carries blessings is nectar, is a general way we can describe it. And if you see the Tibetan, the word is dutsi. Dutsi is nectar. And it means a lot of things in a lot of different contexts, but if you're thinking about light giving you blessings, what you're really saying is there, I'm opening up to a pathway. You know, all of the enlightened beings are sending, 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 but I'm not receiving until I open. Mm -hmm. And from a Buddhist perspective, a blessing is that which transforms the mind. So, it's kind of what moves a teaching that you've heard and understood intellectually 
into a heart experience that you feel and know. That movement from head to heart, that's a blessing. And it's not bestowed upon you, poor fools in samsara. It's not bestowed, okay? It's that there is the condition of the Buddhas always, but if you haven't created the substantial cause in your own mind, you can't have a realization or a deeper understanding. So if you've created the substantial cause for deeper understanding, connecting with the Buddhas is a powerful condition to awaken that. And that's one of the side elements of prayer and of visualizing the nectar. It, does that make sense a little bit more? Yeah, it, it makes sense. And, and I under, also understand I should keep coming back to get the private conversation and, and you know, it'll come. Thank you. That's a good foundation for me. Yeah, yeah. And thanks for asking. And uh, I don't want to squash anybody's questions. Um, but also, you know, some of this is going online and some of you don't have empowerments. And so we just have to tiptoe a little bit. A little bit, but that's enough to be getting on with, I think. And the blessing conversation is a really good one to have with yourself. What is a blessing? What am I receiving? What is being watered? These are really important thoughts to have with yourself. And you could have, you know, constant watering of a garden, but if there are no seeds there, nothing will grow there. You know, so we've got to be planting seeds. Um, yeah, Heather, what the thoughts? Yeah, I was just struck by the way that you articulated the energy that accompanies anger. And how is that different than the energy of anger? It's, it's an important distinction because, you know, it's, it's like habitually, there's this energy that accompanies attachment that accompanies anger that accompanies ignorance. And they're, they go together as if they're the same thing, but they're separate. Just like we assume pain and suffering are the same thing because they so often go together. And then with mental training, you can see, oh, they're two separate things. I can be having pain, but not suffer from it mentally, you know, for example, or suffer less from it, right? Um, so it's kind of breaking associations. And there's so many things in Buddhism like this, like, um, you know, when we're trying to concentrate and we're trying to be focused, we have to break our association with stress because normally focus and stress go together. So we have to break that association, keep the focus, chuck the stress. And we want a relaxed mind, but normally relaxation goes with sleep. So we need to break that association, keep the relaxation, chuck the sleep, you know? So in this context, we're trying to say that energy is not positive or negative in and of itself. It can become distorted or it can become enlightened. And so the distorted form of the Akshobhya Buddha family, the Vajra family, the distorted form is anger, but the enlightened form is mirror-like wisdom, but it's just energy. And this can really help us change the way we think of our own mental habits, because in your daily life, when you're in your power or when you're effective, when you're helping people, it might have similar qualities to when you are awful and damaging and horrible to be with. So rather than thinking I'm a horrible, angry person, you can think I'm a Vajra family Akshobhya type, which means this energy, which is neutral, can go distorted and angry and harmful, or it can go mirror-like and sharp and precise. And it's my choice, which I emphasize. So then you don't feel like you're like stifling your default energy you know, then who you are is already perfect raw material. And you don't have to change the energy you have, you just have to direct it in the correct way. So this is part of why I think Tantra helps kind of modern people, because if you're forever in the sutra path thinking about antidote this, antidote this, antidote this, it's really easy for us because of how we were brought up to think that we're bad and need to be fixed. You know, it's so easy to think, here are all of my faults and here are all the way to fix my faults or I'm full of poison, here's all the ways to have my antidotes. And you can start to think the wrong way in the sutra path, even though that's not the intention of the sutra path and people that didn't grow up like us don't have those same connotations and associations. But because we do, 
helpful to go to Tantra because then there's nothing to antidote. It's just about direction and directing energy in effective, constructive, beneficial ways and preventing it from going down the wrong way. And when we say you belong to a Buddha family already or of your certain Buddha family type already, it's not inherent, right? Nothing's inherent, but from beginningless time until now, you've met different circumstances and different conditions, and you've developed certain trends, you know, certain habitual trends. And if you think of your friends and family and you were to organize them into type, you could probably do it quite quickly as soon as you learn about the qualities and characteristics of each of the Buddha families. And so instead of working against type, you seek out teachings of that type knowing eventually you're gonna integrate all of them. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever done like Myers-Briggs back in the day when it was like really popular and you know, it, it can be problematic. Acknowledge, disclaimer, problematic Myers-Briggs. Yes, but you know, I don't know if your Myers-Briggs test giver ever said this to you, but I remember it really striking me. They said, if you're kind of in a less mature space, you are very, very much one type. And as you mature, there's more flexibility in which type you test as, and you're more likely to be kind of integrated all types, you know, kind of like 20% all of them instead of 100% all of them, you know? And, um, and I remember thinking that when I was a kid and I first took the test and I was an INFP, like 100%, you know? Yes, who else? I'm sure many Buddhists are. Um, or, and, then, um, and then a few years later after some Dharma, I became an INFJ not a coincidence. And if it was like primordially the core of who I was, how could it change? You know, and I'm sure if I took it now, it'd probably be all over the shop and depend on the day. And that doesn't mean I've become unintegrated. That be means I've become more integrated. So similarly, these five Buddha families, think of them like personality types where you really trend as one, but then eventually you have flexibility with all of them. Yeah. But something interesting that just came up when you were talking, um, one of the things that I do in my, in my consulting work is I, I try to help somebody um, be more clear on what they're trying to say. And, and through conversations, you kind of get to that. And one of the methods that I've always used without knowing any of what you just said is if you, if you kind of make somebody mad, mm. you know, like grill them what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? And they start to get mad. Then they get very clear yeah. on what they're going to say. And I, I just now put together, that's, that's kind of what you're getting at in a way, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you can um, be skillful with it without it being actual anger, then it's such a good skill. But I think it's why um, the Tibetans are so all about debate. Hmm. And if you've ever seen the way they debate, it's like not like peaceful, is it? You know, they are fierce with each other. And there's this whole like dominance gesturing, like it's very testosterone-y like boy weirdness, you know, but it's fun when you get in the mood for it. But like one is sitting and one is standing and the one is standing and like clapping right in the face of the one sitting and saying, what do you think about this smack? What do you think about this smack? Like, it's like, oh, I thought Buddhists were peaceful. But afterwards, they're just like laughing and playing and they're just like friends, you know, like it's fierce, but it does help them get precision. What do you actually think? What do you actually think? So it has that Manjushri sword. And I think as we go along the path, we get more and more precise with our sword. So it's not cutting painfully. It's just cutting through the cobwebs of our confusion. Yeah. <clears throat> And uh, yeah, well, anger is an, an interesting one because of course, anger itself is the wish to harm. And because of that is never justified, but the energy that accompanies it is incredibly powerful. And sometimes we feel like, I don't know how to be assertive without it. I don't know how to stick up for myself without it. I don't know how to be clear and sharp unless I'm squeezed into a corner that has that vibe or you get up against a deadline and you feel squeezed and there's that kind of angry, panicky, grumpy, but then it kind of like chills into clarity and you get a whole bunch of things done very quickly with fierce precision and focus. And all of those things are worth investigating because we can remove the wish to harm from it. We're just used to it being there. Yeah. <clears throat> 
And, and you know, and a nice example of that is, is maybe someone like, um, I don't know, Venerable Rabina on a good day. You know, she can be so fierce and it can feel so loving, so loving. Um, I'm sure we can think of examples in our own life of people who are just, you know, completely sharp and precise and clear, but it doesn't hurt when it lands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. other iconography thoughts before we shift to mantra? Yeah, Eleanor, go ahead. Huge. Um, I guess there's one thing that when we're doing the sadhanas and there's always a reference to males. There is males. no, like the sons. Oh, no, yeah. You know, so I don't know whether I'm doing the right thing or not, but I kind of, in my mind, I always at the daughters, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not sorry. Who are you talking to? Come on. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'd say, let's just say daughters instead. Screw the sons. Yeah, yeah. No, but there's a reason for it, right? <laughs> Like, yeah. you know, remember who you're talking to. I'm right with you, right? But there's yeah. sun is for a reason. And it can be triggering for women because we're like, enough with the patriarchy, for goodness sakes, that yeah. Buddhism pure. Ugh. But um, we have to manage our reactivity and find out the yeah. reason why. Yeah. So um, from a Buddhist perspective, sons refers to lineage. Lineage. So um, who are the ones who will inherit the blessings, the realizations, the intelligence of the Buddhas, they are the bodhisattvas. Yes, the bodhisattvas are going to um, inherit the qualities of the Buddha because they're learning from them and then they'll become Buddhas themselves. Yes. So we use this terminology in reference to lineage. Yeah, the conquerors and their sons. And so there used to be, mostly in the 90s, a lot of our prayers we changed to say the conquerors and their children or the Buddhas and their children and tried to use gender neutral language. And then we reverted back to the original direct translation because we didn't want to miss what it meant and the layers of it from the people who wrote them. But what would happen now is that, say we have an enlightened being who is a contemporary human these days, someone like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who writes prayers that we use, he would use more gender neutral language or yeah. gender language, because in this mm -hmm. day and age, gender and familial bonds and all of these things mean something different. Mm -hmm. So it's always the context of when was the era this prayer was written, then what does that mean in the context of the time? And mm -hmm. so rather than just changing it to make ourselves comfortable, it's mm -hmm. better to look at the deeper reasons for why it says that, mm -hmm. because also it helps us understand that everything is relative and contextual and merely labeled by the mind. And if one little word is enough to trigger us, we have to really look at the way we're grasping at inherent existence mm -hmm. and assuming that words always mean the same thing in every context. Right. You know, yeah. so so just know that that there was a whole push to change all the language of all of our prayers back in the day. And we, we changed it all to children, children, children. Um, and then yeah. we took a little step back and reflected and we're like, actually, that does a disservice to the root text. Yeah, I pre yeah, I appreciate that. I think having come from a, a pa pa patriarchal background, you know, like there's, there's always that kind of kind of move to to move away from that absolutely yeah 100%. yeah 100 but yeah. i mean the same thing can happen where you can trap your mind in form like and think you can fall into the trap of thinking manjushri is a male because he's male presenting mm. yeah he's yeah. a buddha I, yeah. buddhas don't have it's, gender <laughs> no, right but it's he's presenting right. male for a specific purpose you know mm -hmm. Yeah, um, appreciate that. And, and part of Tantra too is this other piece of or, overcoming ordinary appearance and grasping. And yes. I heard someone say this at a highest yoga Tantra retreat where it should be all senior students who know better. This woman said, I don't wanna be Yamataka, I wanna be Vajrayogini because Yamataka is a boy and Vajrayogini is a girl. Like you've completely missed the point of Tantra. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like Yamataka is also a buffalo. <laughs> Right, like we are also not a buffalo. <laughs> he also has mm. nine heads. Like, come on, 
Yes. You, know, you want to be yeah. watching a guinea? She's blood red. Do you really want to be blood red? <laughs> you know, like we're talking about overcoming ordinary appearance and grasping and you're getting yeah. trapped in like divine genitalia. Like that's a little bit silly, but understandable, mm. understandable. So um, mm. always ask that question, but try and manage reactivity when you read these things. Yeah. You know, um, mm. in the prayer that we read at the beginning of the sadhana, the calling the guru from afar, there's some language there that's a little bit provocative, like um, abandoned by all the Buddhas. And you think, I'm not abandoned by all the Buddhas. Aren't they everywhere? And it's, but there's a reason for saying that. What they're saying is we don't have the karma to see the full Nirmanakaya and Sambhogakaya aspect of the Buddhas in front of us right now. We have karma with Shakyamuni Buddha, but we don't see him in front of us. We see human beings. We see the aspect of fault. And so it's as Ooh. if we've been abandoned by the Buddhas when in fact we haven't. But yeah. you're thinking that your connection to the Buddhas is through the guru. And the whole point of the prayer is connection to the teacherness, the guru ness, yeah. you know, and right. looking at all the layers and aspects and versions of that. You know, and or you can think, oh, I don't want to be reborn a foolish, stupid animal. That's mean. That's provocative language. Animals are smart. What about dolphins? There's a point of saying that animals mm. can't study Dharma. You know, they can be wonderful, you know, seeing eye dogs and all sorts of, you know, amazing stuff with elephants and have a documentary fest and yay animals. And yes, they're simpler and more direct with their love. Yes, the things. Yes. And they can't study Dharma. So there's a point in kind of like giving us a little little jab there of, oh, right. Because you do hear in Dharma centers people saying, oh, I'd love to be reborn as a cat and just bask in the sun and be cuddled. You hear people say that and you'll yeah. just waste 15 years of your life using up merit, not studying Dharma, forgetting things that you learned. Don't be a cat. Mm. There's like, another word that is provocative for me yeah, sometimes. Sure. And that is savior. Savior, yeah. Yeah, I can't, you know, that has a, that has a, a lot of meaning. Okay. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And the yeah. alternative translator, the alternative translation is protector. Yeah. And so that for the same word in Tibetan, you can say savior or protector. And that one's a translator choice. And for some people, protector is equally cringy. And it's just, it's, there's almost no avoiding the triggers of our previous conditioning. So when we say protector or we say savior, neither of them are saying that the Buddha is going to reach down and swoop in and take us out of samsara and put us into a pure land. None of it is like that. But what we're saying is you embody the teachings. When I integrate the teachings, I will save myself. When I integrate the teachings, I will protect myself. And you are the savior in the sense of the one who presents these methods. Yeah, so you save me because you present these methods for me to save myself. I, I, and, think, I think that, that prayer to Lama Zopa, you know, mm, we're savior of myself and others. That yeah. always kind of, yeah, yep. yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm right there with you. And I, I had to do a lot of pushing back against my teachers and questioning yeah. and kind of like, why does it say that? Why does it say that? That sounds yeah. empowering. That doesn't sound Buddhist. The whole point of Buddhism is that you liberate yeah. yourself and, you know, totally. I'm, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with yeah. you. So at a certain point, we have to realize that English carries the connotation of Christianity and psychology. Yeah. And we're going to have to use some words of Christianity and psychology in describing Buddhist tools, but the same word is going to have a totally different meaning, just like the word attachment. You know, yes. people are like, oh, I don't want to give up attachment. Attachment's good. And you're like, attachment parenting has a valid, re well, yes, okay, whatever. Yes, attachment parenting, cuddle the baby. That's fine. We're talking about an exaggeration of positive qualities, which leads to unrealistic expectations. So cut that out. <laughs> you know but it's the same word and you're going to be reactive yeah. if you kind of came to love a certain philosophy that has the same name and now we're saying get rid of that you know so so again and again this will come up in buddhism where mm. a word that we think we know 
means something totally different in the Buddhist context. And always ask and always just take a pause when you notice yourself getting reactive and, and always think, is that a translator issue? Is that a context issue? Is that a time and a place and an audience issue? Because there's always a greater context for these words. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so they're really, it's good to always ask when you get a bit triggered, but just to know that there's always that background thing of English carries its connotations. Yeah. Sometimes even old translations will use sin instead of negativity. And you're like, oh my God, no, <laughs> you know, unless like me, you were brought up Methodist and sin just means missing the mark, <laughs> missing the mark, but it could mean well, <laughs> something totally different in another tradition. Right. And you're like, yeah, oh, yeah. Man. So managing reactivity <laughs> is tricky. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank Any you. other, yeah, no worries. And thank you for asking. Um, other thoughts and questions. Yeah. Pia, go ahead. I have a question on the hair. Mm. Because I uh, yesterday and also today I uh, notice I get confused. It's very silly, but I don't understand what these five knots are. Where mm. are they in the in the picture? I don't see them. So, so I just wanted to know. Yes, very good. Um, okay, we're gonna bring up the picture. We're gonna have a little look. Okay, so. Um, you don't do not see five knots, obviously. You see kind of a very elaborate bun situation. <laughs> yes. And what what's happening with the depiction is that often instead of the five knots, they have the five crown. They have five jewels on a crown instead of the five knots in a lot of the artists' representations. And the five knots represent the five Buddha families pretty much across the board, you might find variation occasionally, but the five Buddha families being uh, Lotus family, Amitabha, um, Ratna family, Ratna Sambhava, this one should be white, uh, Verachana and uh, the Buddha family, Amoga City and uh, the Karma family, and then Akshobhya and the Vajra family. So these five represent those five knots spoken about in the sadhana. And often you'll see a crown instead of the five knots. And there's a lot of this kind of like royal jewelry stuff, you know, and you're like, aren't they monks? What? Or aren't they monastic? Or aren't they renounced? And then you see, you might see like Amitabha in the aspect of a monk and then Amitayas looking like a fancy prince and think, what? You know, and that's um, that's a difference between like a Sambhogakaya and Nirmanakaya aspect. So that's kind of another conversation of iconography, but the jewels aren't there to be fancy. The jewels are there to represent um, the kind of elevated status of someone working in this way. And they often represent the Sambhogakaya aspects of a Buddha. Um, sometimes they represent like the Eightfold Path or, um, uh, yeah, usually the Eightfold Path and things like that. There's um, a really nice description in um, a book called Vajrasattva Meditation. And I'm going to try and remember the name of the guy. Oh, I don't remember. It's one of these nice Vajrasattva books with tons and tons of pictures. And it goes through what all of the jewels and ornaments and scarves and embellishments, what they all represent. So they're not there to like indicate we need to have this like opulent presentation. Um, you know, here's, here's me a little nun who wears the same clothes every day and has no hair. And you know, these are my practices. And obviously I've not started wearing silken garments. <clears throat> so yeah, it's, I'm glad you asked. Yeah, so the five knots are depicted by the five crown which represents the five Buddha families and artists sometimes go off book. Yeah. Yeah. Other iconography questions? Okay. Uh, mantra. <clears throat> so it would seem easy to describe a mantra, but this is one of the mantras that has layers and layers and layers of meaning. This is the, <laughs> sadly, this is the easy form and it's not that easy, but OM at least is easy. OM always means enlightened body, speech, and mind. So OM always means enlightened body, speech, and mind. 
Ah, very briefly, is door to insight because of natural purity. Natural purity means that everything is pure by nature in the sense of everything is empty of inherent existence. And so it's just kind of an aspect of emptiness to connect with, to help de-identify from afflictions and ignorance. And then Ra is door to insight without stains. And this indicates the teaching that you would have heard many times that all of the stains in the mind, all of the imprints and negative karma and all of the delusions are adventitious or extra, additional, removable. So there are stains, but they are not primordially integrated with the mind itself. They can be completely discarded and purified. Pa is door to insight expounded ultimately in the sense of ultimately everything is empty of inherent existence, even though relatively we have to use words which have a kind of concealer truth aspect or a kind of a deceptiveness because they have the flavor of inherent existence. Okay, um, then Tsa or Tsa, depending on how you're pronouncing it, Tsa is more the Tibetan translation, Cha, Tsa um, is more close to the Sanskrit. So you'll see this uh, syllable written in two different ways and even three different ways, I've put a D there. Um, tsa is kind of how we pronounce it in our tradition. And this is related to door to insight that is unfathomable. So insight for someone who hasn't realized emptiness directly is beyond comprehension, imperceivable, but we will be able to perceive it once we've realized emptiness directly. Na is the door to insight of mere name related to the fact that all phenomena exist in mere name or merely labeled on the valid basis. And D is the seed syllable encompassing all. So that whole mouthful just means wisdom. Yes, this is the mantra of wisdom. This is the mantra to cut through ignorance. Yes. So if someone says to you, what does the Manjushri mantra mean? You can say, may it help me integrate and embody wisdom and cut through ignorance. But that's the short version. There are many layers to that. And uh, Lotsala House, which is a really amazing resource online, has a beautiful teaching on this. And I'm just going to bring it up briefly. And the document, which uh, Teresa has linked in the chat, says the meaning of the six syllables of the King of Vidya Mantras, the heroic Lord Manjushri by Jampel Dewanima. So he's saying briefly explained into three main themes the generation stage, the completion stage, and the great perfection. And when you guys without empowerment see these two words, generation stage and completion stage, skip it. So these are words that would need a great deal of commentary. You need an empowerment. You need a lot of explanation to understand these two practices. So when you see these two, skip them until you have highest yoga tantra, until you have a Vajra guru. So we're gonna to jump to the great perfection explanation, which is um, more suitable for everybody. <clears throat> and so just have a little read here. And uh, let's see, Teresa, can you go ahead and read it? I need to grab some water. Can you read that out loud? Sure. Three, the great perfection. Uh, there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, okay, I got to get closer because my eyes are not good. Awe symbolizes the present ordinary mind when unattained by fabrications, the great Dharmakaya whose nature transcends any words, thoughts, or descriptions. The realization of the great Dharmakaya is the direct introduction to the face of awareness itself. Wow, there's a, something at the bottom. Okay, Ra symbolizes its radiance, the unceasing Kaya arising as the limitless display of the Kayas and wisdoms. While not grasping at this, 
one gains certainty in the nature of the bliss display and adornment, the natural radiance of the Dharmadatta, free from proliferation or reduction. This is the realization of the Samboakaya or the decision upon one thing and one thing only. Pa, sim, uh, ra, pa, pa symbolizes remaining effortlessly aware of this innate indestructible state. This union of awareness and emptiness devoid of something maintaining or something maintained. This is the wisdom of the Nirmanakaya or confidence in the direct liberation of rising thoughts. Om Rapasa, rep Sa symbolizes having confidence in this view and on the basis of the three crucial points remaining free from attachment to whatever arises in limitless ways through the gates of the wisdom of outwardly radiant visions on the path of the four lamps. Na symbolizes integrating these essential practices so that one traverses the path of the four visions. Then within the space of inner luminosity, the display of outer luminosity will dissolve within the inner space by means of the six special qualities of Samantabhadra. D symbolizes actualizing the benefit for oneself, the attainment of supreme awakening, so that for eons to come, one manifests the luminous body of great transference and continuously engages in compassionate activity. Wow. Thank you for reading that. Sorry to put you on the spot. Now I have my beverage. <clears throat> Excuse me for clearing my throat. Um, so it's a mouthful. It's a lot to unpack. I don't want to overwhelm you. The reason that I offer resources like that is that I don't want us to fall into the trap of oversimplification and missing some of the depth and nuance. So even if you can't grasp the depth and nuance right away, Keeping it simple, I don't want it to mean watered down. I want us to know when we're surface and I want us to know when we're digging deeper. And there, there's so much out there that is Dharma light and is out of context and is mixed with people's own ideas. And hopefully I avoid falling into that trap, but I'm sure that I do sometimes as well. And so if you always can tap back into valid sources like this, even if they kind of go over our heads, plants the seed. And I think even if you read that same passage four times, it would be clearer. It's just the first time is always hard. So we kind of have to break the ice too with some of these scarier, <laughs> more, um, I don't know, meaty or dense kind of texts. We have to just break the ice. So um, have a look at that at some point, but if you don't have the empowerment, just look at that section that Teresa read, that great perfection section. Don't look at the generation stage and completion stage. Um, I know it's sort of tantalizing when you see things you're not supposed to look at, you know, like it's not the end of the world, but some of it could trigger wrong views. Yeah, and wrong views become an obstacle to your path. So this is one of the big reasons why things of higher yoga tantra are more secret. It's not like you're not able to understand if someone explained it to you, but without explanation, you might get the totally wrong understanding and go down the wrong road. And that creates huge obstacles. So um, I always recommend um, for people that wanna study their bodhisattva vows, this book called Succession Guru Yoga by Serme Kensar um, Rinpoche, um, Geshe Tarchin. But the tantric vows, you're not allowed to read. <laughs> so it's one of these things where if we can kind of get into a discipline of knowing it's there, referring to it later when we have permission and when we're ready. Um, you know, I have a book that I look at a lot on Yamantaka and it has Yamantaka Solitary Realizer and 13 Deity Yamantaka. I only have Solitary Realizer. So I have to really discipline myself not to read the second half of the book about 13 deity. It's not the end of the world, but it's a, it's a good kind of a discipline to get yourself into to really respect the guidelines that have been set out. So, um, so if we can just kind of have that in the back of our minds as well.
And uh, if you do run across or read something that you're not really supposed to, little Vajrasattva, and then stop it. Okay, so don't have a whole guilt and shame flood. Okay, it's just, you know, it's natural, it's human to be like, ooh, what's in there, right? But um, like this. So questions about the mantra or questions about any bits of the Sonata? Yeah, Teresa, go ahead. I probably just need to read it over again, but just in that first reading, wow, there's a lot, which is super cool. I'm really excited to look more at it. And D, the explanation for D sounds very much to me like the explanation for Om. Mm, I don't, yes. and I, there is a difference. I know there is, but just over that cursory reading, I don't know what it is. Well, it, it says symbolizes actualizing the benefit for oneself and the attainment of supreme awakening so that for eons to come, one manifests the luminous body of great transference, continually engaging in compassionate activity. So it, what it sounds like to me is that, that the D is the aspiration, the OM is already accomplished, right? The OM is already enlightened body, speech, and mind. The D is, may I have that? And you'll find that at the end of a lot of mantras where there's a whom or a soha, and it usually means everything that was said before, may I embody and integrate it. Yeah, so it seems like it's a similar case. Yeah, yeah, other, other thoughts? Um, there's a tradition of doing Lama Tsongkhapa Guru Yoga, which is called Gandan Lagama in conjunction with this practice, or even um, there's a sadhana that merges them. So there's, if you're a Gandan Lagama enthusiast, <laughs> there is um, a practice that integrates these two that's really lovely. Um, FPMT on the foundation store site, they have a copy of that. Um, Gandan Lagama is called Lama Tsongkhapa Guru Yoga or the hundreds of deities of the land of joy. So anyway, side note there. So that's a good way of kind of connecting with guru yoga and deity yoga and getting them really to merge together. Um, let's see. So yes, Sadhana questions before we call it a day or miscellaneous Tantra questions. Just could you give the title of the Sadhana you just mentioned? Yes, um, it's Lama Tsongkhapa Guru Yoga, or the hundreds of deities of the land of joy. And the version that has the seven wisdoms plugged right into it can be found um, on the FPMT site, and you can just download the PDF from them. Wonderful, thank you. I think there is a leaf blower outside my door, so apologies for that. <laughs> If you can hear that. Um, and thanks for blowing my leaves. <laughs> I wish you'd use a broom. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So yeah, any other Tantra stuff, guys? Any miscellaneous um, or anything from the prayers that we used? We launched the practice with a different prayer each time. You don't have to launch it with a prayer if you don't want to, but it's a good way to kind of connect with the whole path and to remember your sutra connection with your tantra practice. Um, foundation of all good qualities or the three principal aspects of the path, either of those would be really suitable. Um, the heart sutra, of course, because it's related to emptiness. And then today we did calling the guru from afar, which there's a short version and a long version. And I think that's a very good way of understanding all of the layers and nuances of what a guru is. Well, if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and dedicate. Jancho Samcho Rinpo She Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyo Chi Ke Panyam Pa Me Pa Yi Gone Gondu Pawa Sho Toni Dawa Rinpo She Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyo Chi Ye pa nyam pa me pa yi, go ne gondu pa wa shou.
the wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, the incomparably kind Supreme Tenzin Gatso, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. Remembering the emptiness of the agent, the action, the object, all dependently arise. Okay.